Mm. Greetings, everyone. Wow. My name is Ashara Ikundayo. I am an independent curator and cultural strategist and really honored to have you all join us for this edition of Blatant, which is a philanthropic and online zine and conversation where Black women artists come to talk about life. We talk about art, rage, joy, peace, beauty. It's really um, been a beautiful kind of conversation and we would be remiss if we didn't honor our ancestor, Queen Mother Cicely Tyson today at the beginning of our show. Uh, it's going to be really special to visit with my comrades, Mayori Kamal Holmes and Yoruba Richin. And, you know, the show has been about visual art and not so much about film artists and new media artists and documentary artists. So we're in for a treat today. It'll be a series of video clips uh, and film clips. Uh, I wanna thank the Museum of the African Diaspora for continuing to hold this conversation with us on our Artists as First Responder platform. And I wanna invite you all to, to join us each month if you happen to miss this show or wanna watch past blatant episodes, you can check it out on the Museum of the African Diaspora's YouTube page. That's it, welcome and uh, let's get into it. I always want to acknowledge the land that our conversations are happening from, the land that I'm broadcasting this from, and the servers that the Museum of the African Diaspora uses, and many of our arts and cultural institutions are, are on the land of indigenous First Nation people. And I'm broadcasting today from my artist residency spot in San Francisco, which is a uh, a beautiful home, you know, it's in what's called Coal Valley. And this is the traditional native land of the Ohlone Nation, of the Ramatash uh, Ohlone people. And so I want to honor them and honor the work that they have done to continue to steward this land and allow us to walk softly with, hopefully with some beauty and some grace on it. And I want to also honor my African ancestors uh, who continue to hold us up, to teach us from the veil, those of us who are here and those of us who are coming. And that includes all beings, all of the teachers that come to us uh, as creatives and as artists. And, and with that, I wanna say hello again to Yoruba and Mayori and have you all uh, greet us as well and, and tell us about the land that you're coming to us from today. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for, for having us, Ashara. It's beautiful to be here and to be in conversation with you and Mayori. Um, I'm talking to you from upstate New York, Hudson Valley, uh, which is the traditional land of the Lenape people. Um, but it's all, and it's also uh, a very uh, important place in African American history. Um, Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth also have roots in upstate New York. And um, I honor my ancestors who worked the land, um, who were slaves and, and, and uh, worked for freedom for our people and who for sure inspire me and guide me in terms of my work. So thank you. I'll show you. 
Thank you. Mayori? Yeah, <laughs> um, I'm so happy to be in conversation with Yoruba, whose work I've admired for a really long time and nice to be reconnected with you, Shara, um, after what feels like a thousand years ago. Um, I am not from this area. Um, I'm originally from California with roots in Oklahoma um, and Mississippi and Alabama, but I have been in Philadelphia for quite some time, uh, which is the ancestral home of the Lenny Lenape. And I'm in the East Kensington neighborhood at the moment. Thank you for that. Um, I guess I'm, excuse me while I like, I'm gonna try to lift my screen. <laughs> Or a little bit, a little bit higher, and see if that's helpful. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, we're going to get into to this conversation today, and you know, one of the questions that I like to start the conversation with is around blatant uh, as a definition and the, an experience that you've had recently around blatant joy or blatant rage. And, you know, sometimes folks are like, well, you know, what do you, what do we mean by blatant joy? And, you know, we're talking about unabashed, brazen in your face, right? We're talking about, I don't believe that that just happened. And, you know, we've got lots of examples of uh, blatant behavior in our society today. You know, but, you know, give me an example of something that has recently arisen for you in terms of blatant behavior? Well, that's a, a, a big, <laughs> good topic. Um, you know, when you look at, you just, you mentioned blatant joy and blatant rage, right? I feel like um, those two things, um, those two feelings, those two emotions, have driven my work, have actually been instrumental in the, the work that I do. Um, and, you know, the two examples uh, of blatant joy and blatant rage, it's actually driven my work and kept me going. People always ask, you know, how do you keep going? What inspires you? And in fact, it's those two emotions that can seem contradictory, but that actually fuel the work that I do. So, um, an example of the blatant rage that uh, fueled my work is the killing of Breonna Taylor. Um, mm -hmm. And I did a film uh, called The Killing of Breonna Taylor that came out in September. It was, we made the film while the investigation was still happening or before the results of the investigation came out. And when I was asked if I, you know, to be a director, to direct this film, I uh, knew that it was something that I had to do because of the outrage and sadness and anger that I felt about what had happened to this young woman and wanting to find out why. Because at that point in June, this was in June, you know, we had few answers about why this woman was, young woman, was killed in her home by police. Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, when I was asked to, to be, you know, to make this film, I, what, what drew, what motivated me was to find out answers. We knew what had happened was wrong. I mean, to say the least in a, uh, but why, what was it that had led to these tragic events? And so that was an example of blatant rage, really, yeah. fueling the work. Um, mm -hmm. And then just in terms of the blatant joy, how it feels to be free, which I think we're going to see some clips from, was a, uh, that took me five years to make, to find the funding, to put together the team that could uh, manifest and, and make this film. And that was inspired by wanting to celebrate, acknowledge and celebrate what we as African-American women entertainers and artists had, how we had trailblazed and changed representation of our own image within an industry that was built on racism and sexism and how these six women changed the game 
for Black women representation and set up what we see today in terms of uh, a real, um, uh, more, probably more Black female storytelling that we've ever seen. And these women were the trailblazers and they had not, their story had not been told um, or had not been told in, in a way that I thought really, you know, that you understood what they did and the significance of what they did and their role in the Black freedom struggle. Um, so those are two examples of how blatant joy and blatant rage fuel the work that I do. Yeah, thank you for that. And I'll, I'll just follow up with a, a short introduction. Um, thank you all for who are just joining us here for the blatant conversation where Black women artists muse on about love, joy, rage, uh, and art, of course. Yorba Richin is an award-winning documentary filmmaker whose work has been featured on PBS, New York Times, uh, Frontline Digital, New York Magazine, on and on and on. It is beautiful and impressive. Her latest film, How It Feels to Be Free, premiered on PBS, American Masters, just last month. We are going to talk a bit about it and see some clips from it. Uh, you also just mentioned your recent work from the New York Times Presents, The Killing of Breonna Taylor, which was also featured on FX and Hulu, which is where I watched it. And earlier, uh, or last year, I guess, I watched a film that I, was, I knew nothing about, which was so brilliant, called The Sit-In. Harry Belafonte hosts The Tonight Show, uh, which also I watched on Peacock. So there's, there's so many more uh, accolades to lay upon you, all well-deserved. And I'm such a documentary uh, geek that, you know, it's, it's, you know, I don't even know what to say, you know, how many films that we can watch. Um, but I wanna, so I just wanna thank you for that, for that work and for keeping us, I think, entrenched in a conversation that is about freedom. And that's what we're talking about today. This, this is the thread we're pulling today. Thank um, you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Mayori, can you talk about a recent instance of blatant joy and or blatant rage. Yeah, I was trying to think um, of an example of blatant rage. And I think I've unfortunately, like so many of us um, have learned to work through that rage and move it. <laughs> so as not to um, hold me up, unfortunately. Um, the most recent example I could think of, I definitely can't talk about, but it's just a fight with uh, a contractor um, who was not a person of color. Um, and I think the way in which they are trying to sort of take advantage of me um, definitely like triggered all the things. And I was uh, in a moment, in a fit of rage, um, justified, but, you know, still having to sort of deal with it. But that's, that was the most ex recent example I could think of. Um, and in terms of blatant joy, I mean, I am... A lot of the work that I do, thankfully at this point, brings me joy um, or brings other people joy and then that is bringing me joy. Um, as tiring and as, ex you know, as it is and exhausted as I often am. Um, but this past weekend, we've been working on this variety show for Black History Month called Black Star Live and um, streaming every Friday. It's been, you know, an experiment and like ridiculous. Um, but for the last show, we're going to have two seven-year-olds in our lives. One is my uh, godson and the other is my good friend's granddaughter. And they're playing uh, versions of me and the other co-host. And I was directing them. We decided to pre-record it because they're children. Um, <laughs> so uh, working with them for two or three hours was just amazing. The things that they the, the little, there was a little girl and a little boy and the little girl led us in a meditation that she learned on YouTube on her own. And I was just like, that moment was really, really beautiful to me. Just the, these digital natives and the things they have access to and who knows <laughs> what else they're picking up. But um, this little girl like led everybody through, she was saying, um, because she, that's how she heard it, but she was leading us through this meditation and, you know, had everyone sitting cross-legged and it was, that was really, really a beautiful moment, so. What a beautiful story, I love this. You know, yeah, these, these native children, their affiliation, I don't know. I've never understood how they kind of came out the womb and knew how to put together things. 
I'm not quite sure about that. Um, but I do want to read uh, a bit of Maori's bio uh, for you all. And I know she's on and off the, the screen at this moment, but Maori Carmel Holmes is the director of the Black Star Film Festival, which she founded in 2012. Since 2002, she has organized programs in film and performance at a myriad of organizations, including the Anthology, Anthology Film Archives, the Institute of Contemporary Art Philadelphia, Barnes Foundation, Asian Arts Initiative, Painted Bride in Philly. Again, many, many, many accolades. Uh, in addition to being a filmmaker, uh, a curator, she has also worked in fashion, which is something that I really didn't know about. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, the fashion design piece. Um, her documentary, Seen That Heard, Women in Philadelphia Hip Hop, uh, was kind of our notable, I think, first feature documentary. Is that is that correct? Uh, and is also she's also a graphic designer and worked on several book projects. We're going to take a look at one of the latest uh, printed pieces that I happen to be the owner of as well. So I want to, you know, just say thank you again for your work and for bringing. I think honor, modeling a way of bringing uh, more women into the conversation as filmmakers and being mentored by people such as, uh, you know, Ava DuVernay being mentored by and mentoring other black women and other black folks uh, in Philly and internationally. So I'm, I'm really excited to, to take a look at some of the things that we decided to, to get into today. Um, were there any any thoughts or anything that you all would like to add, uh, additional grounding questions or statements about each other's work? And yeah, I, I want to say okay. that Black Star has I have not had the opportunity to be part of Black Star yet, but I'm hoping it will happen soon. But Black Star is the festival. Like everyone before, first off, I heard that you're virtual was the jam. It was the jam. I heard it was the, the, the best virtual experience for a festival. But then before that, and it's my own bad that I haven't, you know, was not able to get to Philly in August to be a part of it, but it's just the festival. So I give you so kudos to what you created. I'm so excited to one day be a part of it virtually and in person. And, uh, you know, creating this, I mean, it's, it's just where all the black filmmakers are just excited to be a part of in terms of the networking, the community, and um, it's just amazing. So congratulations to, on what you built. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, and I, you know, like I said, I've been a fan of your work and I think Ashar, especially lifting up, sitting in, which is something uh, my mother and I have been, uh, that's one of the films of the last couple of years. She's my chief viewing partner, even though she lives in a different city, but that that's a film that has definitely been resonating with me for the last couple of years in different ways. And so I really thank you for that, but for all of your work. Um, Ashar, I just wanted to have one clarifying thing. I, I've done costume design, not fashion design. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's a good clarification yeah <laughs> so, what is that um but yeah i i'm it, it's still in the film space um yeah, yeah. okay mary let, let, let's get into let's get into some of the clips um that we have for you and i i know i just sprung on you that i had found a clip uh <laughs> not heard. i know i just sprung that on you but I, I want it, to, because it's my kind of entree into showing your work over the years, um, you know, for, for a while I was a film festival curator when I lived in Denver and worked on the Pan-African Film Festival and, and, you know, traveled internationally to watch films of telling the story of Black people. And this was, this was one of the films that we showed one year. Um, and I remember how excited people were. <laughs> and I'm trying to, I, maybe it'll come back to me, but, you know, my sister Ursula Rucker, you know, who came to the festival with us and, you know, just other uh, Philly crew who were inside and adjacent to the, the hip hop movement and the music at the time um, and the filmmakers at the time, which include folks who are at NYU. So um, Elizabeth and Nia are running tech for us today. Thank you so much, both of you all. But let's, let's get into it and see, let's watch these clips and we'll go back and forth and discuss it.
Oh, that was so fresh. It was so good. Um, let's talk a little about oh, there's one more. No, no, let's let's play it. Sorry, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, could you also check the sound on the Facebook page? I hear that there is no sound playing on the other stream. Could you please check it while we're but go ahead and play this video? Beautiful. Okay, so here's the selection of videos that uh, that you shared and that I told you I snuck that last piece in. Can you talk about your career and like what has been, I think your impetus or just your passion around this? Um, there was a, a question that someone presented to me to ask you, both of you actually, is like, were you the kids who had cameras in your hands when you were four? You know, what, what kind of access did you have to technology that allowed for you to feel like, you know, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take this piece of technology and I'm gonna tell stories with it. So I'm just wondering, you know, Maori as a, a film curator, a producer, a director, uh, an administrator as well, you know, tell us about, you know, how that's come to be your life. Sure. Um, I mean, I think for me, every time I, I talk about my origins, it feels very circuitous. And the older I get, it's starting to look like a bit of a straight line. Um, 
but there isn't, you know, I didn't set, I didn't know what a curator was really as a child. So I, I had no real sense of, uh, a path to that. Um, I think many of the things that I'm doing, I didn't really know that they existed, right? Like producing or arts administration. I feel like all of those were um, far ahead of me. And I was interested in film, um, but I definitely didn't think it was super possible. You know, I didn't know a lot of examples. Um, And then even when I went to film school, I didn't have the greatest experience with faculty to feel like it was a place that would be comfortable for me. Um, And so I think I have made a way as a programmer and curator and arts administrator, and then had this sort of, like, I think a lot of us um, secret or like burning desire to direct or to write and, you know, and finding space for that. Um, Even though I sort of started out that way, but you know, it's been coming back and forth. So, you know, I, there there definitely is no straight line. And I think the question about what I wanted to do as a child, I mean, I was, I think I have a rare um, upbringing in that I was encouraged to be an artist. My mother had been an artist and then didn't pursue it. And her mother had been an artist and didn't pursue it. So I was now the third generation um, showing some talent and uh, being encouraged to do it, but I'm a Taurus. And I did not want to be broke. (laughs) And so all the artists that I knew were either broke or not living lavishly. And so I found myself distracted um, by many other pursuits. Um, The music industry kind of took hold of me, Um, you know, just like being in Atlanta. I, I, we moved to Atlanta when I was in middle school. And so I spent high school there and that seemed like a path that might be possible. Um, And then in college, I got, reconnected to my desire to be in the art world and and thought I might be in museums, but it's definitely been all over the place. And the only thing I can say is that I still draw on all those experiences, right? Like I've still, I've been in and out of the music industry, I've been in and out of the art world in many ways um, and been in and out of film and and they all keep coming back together. Um, So now I feel okay about it. I've definitely spent many years in a lot of therapy trying to figure out why I couldn't choose a path. Um, But now I feel okay about (laughs) where I am, but I didn't have a camera in my hands necessarily. I feel like for someone in, you know, growing up in the eighties that did not feel like that was around for me. Um, My mother uh, dated a photographer, uh, a a photographer, and then a filmmaker. I have a pattern of dating photographers. So I've always been around um, theater and, and, and sort of visual arts in some way. Um, So I think those things were around and just really comfortable um, with the visual arts landscape. But um, the closest thing I did to having a camera in my hands was, you know, staging Barbies in, you know, photo shoots and taking pictures of them. So it all makes sense. It all makes sense to me, you know, uh, and including the what might look like, you know, to some of us, a straight line, uh, the ascent, but I I get that. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, I remember seeing a press release that you were leaving Philly and going to LA to work with Ava DuVernay. Can you talk about that? Because that was a big deal, you know, for those of us who, you know, like kind of knew the grassroots indie route that you had been on, um, despite the success that, that seemed like a really big leap. Was it? Yeah, well, it was, um, so I've been doing Black Star since 2012 and I've had pretty big, part uh, not part-time. <laughs> I've been doing Black Star pretty part-time and had pretty big jobs on the side of it or, you know, in reverse sort of Black Star was on the side of other jobs. So when I started Black Star, I was an associate director at a foundation called Leeway in Philadelphia, which funds women and trans artists creating art for social change. Um, And even though it's a local foundation, it's one of the few, or it was one of the few foundations of its kind. So we had a national profile. Um, So I worked there and would do Black Star. And then um, I decided to try to freelance for a little while and then went back into having a full-time job. And I became director of public engagement at the ICA in Philadelphia. Um, So for me, I had been sort of uh, on this one path of working towards a certain kind of um, 
I think uh, a certain kind of job or a certain level of a job in the nonprofit world. Um, and so Ava invited me to help to start the nonprofit side of Array. And so that felt like a natural step to me. Um, it also felt at the time like it made sense because Black Star was really having a hard time. Um, just, you know, we were, we were from zero to, you know, 100 every single year, like having to raise all the money, spend it, raise it all, spend it. And so people would ask about the festival and I was just like, I don't know if it's happening next year. And I was really tired, you know, <laughs> of working. You can imagine, I mean, I, I always think about that Eric Badu, like, you know, nine to five and six to 10. And it was more like the kinds of jobs that I had were already nine to seven. And then I was like working from eight to two, you know? Um, and that just is not sustainable. And I was really um, exhausted by it. So I thought that um, going to uh, work for Ava and for Array and um, creating a nonprofit would bring the work that I was doing with Black Star and the work that I was doing in the nonprofit space into one job. And that seemed like that would be the, the best space for me. Um, so that's, that's how that happened. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's um, let's let's look at some of the uh, additional projects that we have on deck. Uh, Elizabeth and Nia, if you could go back to the screen share, and then we can look um, look at what else Mayori is is offering to to us. That would be great. We um, I know I have. Let's see. This. Tell us about this art exhibition um, and the work that you did in curating uh, a film series for the Whitney Biennial. But what are we looking at right here? Sure. So this is footage from um, as part of Black Star. Um, I've organized three exhibitions of visual art, um, and this one is from the last one, which was called Assemblage, um, and it took place at Drexel University's Pearlstein Gallery. And it features um, many artists, some of whom have been in Black Star, some have not. Um, this particular exhibition featured work made by collectives. Um, so the work that you see in the far back left of the room, the black and white image, is um, from a promo made for Terrence Nance's Random Acts of Flyness. Um, on the left is work by Emergent, um, oh shoot, I'm forgetting their name. It's not Emergent Strategies, but it's, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting the name of the collective, but the artists are Sage Crump, Ill Weaver, and a lot of folks coming out of Detroit who work um, in various capacities with Emergent Strategy Institute, which is why that's the name that's sticking with me, but that is not the name of their collective. Um, but that is, that is their work on the left, and I will think about it and put it in the chat when I finish. And then the work on the right um, was made with a Philadelphia-based collective um, in collaboration with a filmmaker named Marie Alarcon. Um, and there was work by Teaneg, uh, and um, I think there were six or seven pieces in this show. Um, and so um, I wanted to share that because these have been the things I think when people ask me about, um, not necessarily plate and joy, but you know, the, when I feel the most proud of my work, it has definitely been the exhibitions. Um, so that's something that I'm trying to do more and more. Like I feel like I have, um, I'm the least critical <laughs> of myself in these and I don't know why, maybe because it's not my like actual work so I can be removed from it. But um, I've been really proud of uh, being able to show some of these works I think in a different setting than just a cinema or from a screen. Um, so, and, and you asked about the Whitney's. So I was invited um, by Jane Panetta and Rejeko Hockley to um, they invited three folks, um, filmmakers mostly, um, to design a program as part of the 2019 Biennial. And so that was really great um, to be able to take the work that I've been doing with Black Star and in some other spaces, but to do it um, in a way that would bring um, some artists that may not have been part of the Biennial into that space. So that was really great. Yeah, I'm really interested in, again, like the curatorial aspect, being someone who, who also plays the role of curator from time to time, how the you are able to turn the rock over and move from moving picture and even take the moving picture into a museum setting. 
um, as you know, we're sitting here inside of this museum platform today and thinking about uh, one of the ways I think that the Museum of the African Diaspora has been really uh, generous is that they let go of some of their control and invited more uh, community members, more independent curators into the conversation to you know, figure out what this looks like online. And so to be able to um, also know that that kind of conversation is happening across sector and across geography uh, on your end is really cool as well. Um, let's go to the next slide. Okay, let's talk about this beautiful piece of work because it, for me, it just kind of came out of nowhere. And as soon as I saw it, I went online and I got one. And it is exquisite with this embossed cover. Um, talk, talk a lot <laughs> about you know, this kind of next uh, offering around visual culture, particularly you know, your framing of black film in it. Sure. Um, so for a number of years, I think since 2015, um, Black Stars started including interviews and essays in our, you know, program guides. So when people would come to the festival, they'd get this really beautifully designed book um, and it would have, um, you know, people writing about films in the festival, interviewing filmmakers in the festival. Um, I think we early on, maybe the first or second one, we included a short script for the film. So just trying to kind of give people ways to enter into the work beyond just what they were experiencing in the audience. Um, and then that led us to building, uh, to producing catalogs so that there was, you know, just kind of a traditional program guide. And then we also offered a catalog, um, which tried to look at even more of the work um, in the festival. And, you know, seeing the reactions to that, and particularly from the artists themselves and just from talking to people. Um, and I think there has been generally a growing acknowledgement of the lack of um, platforms and spaces for critics of color to talk about work made by people of color. Um, it seemed like a moment that we could kind of help to bridge some of that. Um, and so, I started putting money away um, in our programming budget and wanting to, you know, to put this together. And so we put together one issue um, and now we're working on the second and uh, really hoping that we're able to make this sustainable in some way and continue to do so. Um, the first issue has been pretty well received. We're still moving it. Um, so please, <laughs> if you're out there, please subscribe. Um, but, you know, it's, it, is a lot of work. Um, I think I underestimated how much it would take for a brand new staff. Um, so like I said, you know, uh, just a few minutes ago, we had been operating the festival in a super, super part-time manner um, from 2012 to 2018. Um, and then in 2019, I started to work for the festival part-time for the first you know, like sort of as part of a day job, if you will. Um, and then we, in 2020, hired a staff that was working at about 80% capacity. Um, and then we started off this year at 100%. But we had before then, everyone was working in a super, super limited um, capacity. And so, you know, we've been really punching above, I think, our weight class for what the organization really was. Um, but anyway, being able to have a staff, I was like, okay, so we can do this magazine now, in addition to the festival, and there's some other projects that we can get out. Um, we had attempted to have the first one come out with the festival. Um, that was pre-pandemic. Um, and then I think, you know, like everything, everything changed last year. So, um, this issue finally came out in November. Um, so, yeah. yeah. And and we have an illustration because at the time we didn't think we'd be able to have original photography. So we invited Makiba Rainey, who's a Philadelphia artist, um, to collaborate on the cover. Rada Blank is a good friend of mine and has been uh, a constant presence at Black Star since the very beginning. And we're so, you know, moved by um, her film and also just her work generally and thought she would be the perfect person to be on the cover of this first issue, so. It is beautiful. Um, I'm someone who collects zines and journals and I, I, I really, I, I told everyone I had to go get this one. I know that you have a really significant 
a group of organizations, foundations that are funding this. I'm wondering, is this a full-time job for people that they're working on this journal all of the time? Um, is there some heavy, no. heavy? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> I mean, it definitely could be a full-time job, but it is split between several different staffs. So um, there's a, a woman named Nihad Qatar serves as our festival director and is also the managing editor of the journal. And then that we have a we have an in-house designer who works with an outside designer on the publication, and then uh, you know many of us are playing um, other different roles. But it is not yet um, full time for any one person. I, I hope that to be true soon. Good. Um, and then the last the last piece we have. Uh, unless there's not a last piece, let's see. What's the next slide? I'm sorry. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yes, many women's. Um, so everyone has become a podcaster now, you know, and then there's also people who are inside Clubhouse and you have all these kind of competing conversations that are happening, but uh, your podcast is really beautiful uh, and exquisite as it, you know, spends, I think, time clearly with your friends. So I pulled out um, a clip from uh, our comrade Dream Hampton, shout out to my hometown as well, Detroit daughter and um, talking a little bit about her work and uh, treasure. Can you, can you play the, the, the section of the podcast for me, please, Elizabeth? So um, tell us about Many Looms and how that came to be, you know, briefly, because we're going to go, we're going to put it in the, in the chat so people can listen to all of the episodes. But. Sure. Um, well, I've been wanting to do a podcast um, for a really long time. Um, I really enjoy talking to people. Um, and I think even in the documentaries that I've made and moderating panels at festivals, um, I feel like I have like a special way of asking questions um, and just feedback that I've gotten in it, it. It's been something that I've been thinking about. And this was something that I think I just took the COVID and <laughs> extra staff capacity to kind of, uh, this is really a pilot season and we just did five episodes. We don't yet have funding for it. Um, so I actually borrowed from, um, I paid for it myself. So, you know, I'm really hoping that we can, um, 
move now that we have these five episodes, we can uh, take it to folks and we're trying to actively raise money to do additional seasons. But um, yeah, I just wanted to talk to filmmakers and cultural workers and artists that I admire um, and get into their process a bit. Those are the things that I really enjoy hearing. And um, I thought that there might be a space for a Black Star to position that. I think there's been a, I thought for a long time I had to kind of separate myself from Black Star and have been realizing that many of the things that I want to do can sort of be funneled through Black Star so they didn't have to wait in some ways. So um, I think a lot of the this past year has been launching those um, in that way. Congratulations. It's uh, mm -hmm. I, I I love being able to look at different aspects uh, of an artist's work and the way in which our processes like take us down these other roads, you know? It's like, okay, so I'm gonna do a zine and now we'll do a book. We're gonna make a film, we're gonna design something. Let's mentor some people. Um, I think that's the way in which, you know, we get free. You know, it's just like allow our curiosity to like take us into passion and be fine with beginner's mind, you know? So thank you for that creativity. Um, we're gonna we're gonna transition over into a conversation about uh, Yoruba's work, but before that, I think uh, it's worth showing you a four minute film. Elizabeth, can you hit play?
Badass Yoruba Richin. Yo. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, can you introduce us to how it feels to be free and you know the conversation that we're we're having on freedom and joy and rage today and and your work. I thought I definitely wanted to show that live performance of Nina because you really get the uh, essence of the spiritual channeling that was happening that you know continues to happen um, and shared with us through her music, her performance, and I think just through the ancestral realm. But um, for you to to have your documentary, you know, connected to that to that understanding of freedom, you know, I'm I'm in, really interested to hear more about that. You're on mute, and you're on mute. Of course, <laughs> there's always that uh, figuring that out even after so many months of being on Zoom. Um, so yeah, so how it feels to be free uh, is about. Six, the six women who you saw in the trailer, Lena Horn, Nina Simone, Diane Carroll, Abby Lincoln, uh, Pam Greer, and Cicely Tyson, and uh, how these women reshaped representation for Black women on stage and screen, and um, uh, their political work, which was both off screen and on the screen in terms of how they uh, portrayed Black womanhood. And uh, the film looks at how they um, built off of each other's career um, and uh, how they set the stage for, as I mentioned earlier, the sort of, you know, real um, renaissance of, of Black storytelling and, and Black women behind the camera that we see today. And I, um, I made this film after reading the book that it was based on. Uh, called uh, uh, How It Feels to Be Free, African-American Entertainers in the Civil Rights Movement by Ruth Feldstein. And I wanted to make, when I read the book, I thought it would make a really powerful film because of the take that, um, that it had, which looked at, it wasn't a biopic, it's not a biopic of these women, but really looked at how they broke through in their particular time period and, feel, and field. And, um, and change the game for how black women were seen and how we saw ourselves and, um, and how their effect and their impact on, um, you know, on subsequent entertainers uh, up till today. So I just thought it was a very interesting take that we hadn't seen in terms of telling uh, our story um, and, and the story of some of our most revered uh, black female entertainers. And part of it too was that I was and have been frustrated with uh, some of the biopics that we've seen of our heroes and of our, you know, and of our icons, which tend to focus on the tragedy um, and the uh, and and put that first. And some reason they seem to, for some reason they seem to be doing it you know, with our icons, even though there's white entertainers that have many tragic stories as well. Um, so I really was frustrated with that approach and I thought it minimized the impact of who these women were and what they represented. So I wanted to, to, to show a new take and a new understanding of how important these women were for us uh, as, you know, in terms of, um, the industry and in terms of how we viewed ourselves mm -hmm. um, and how these women were all um, looking for and searching and, and, and imbuing in their roles freedom and what it meant and what freedom meant for black women um, in different ways, but in ways that are all, I think, pretty fascinating um, and, uh, you know, um, and really, you know, again, set up the stage for what we see today in terms of Black women creators. Yes, indeed. Thank you for that. I was, um, I enjoyed every aspect of the film. I was uh, surprised actually to hear the story of Lena Horne. Um, one, of, one of the clips that we'll show in a few minutes is uh, from Alicia Keys talking about 
you know, one of her fantasies uh, to play Lena Horne. And just, I think, you know, some of the different kinds of struggles that, you know, we, we can guess that were happening with Black women in uh, those in the industry and Black women who are um, also showing up as organizers and activists in their communities. Um, and particular for me, uh, Abby Lincoln and the impact that Abby Lincoln had on her, on, on, on her peers uh, and the consequences that she had to pay for that. And so I'm wondering, you know, how that is showing up you know, for filmmakers like you today, you know, is what what kind of backlash uh, might be coming or maybe has been part of your experience from the stories that you're telling, the truth telling that's going on? Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll say that and then if you, you know, want to respond and then we're going to show a couple of clips uh, from the New Black and from your TED Talk. But I'm just, I'm wondering, is, has there been some kind of like response to you that is not so positive from the stories that you're telling? You know, I have to say that I am extremely lucky to, uh, you know, be uh, working at a time where uh, our stories are being acknowledged. And I, I was just joking actually earlier today with a, a white producer who uh, I was talking to about a project and he talked about all these like amazing black stories that are out there and so much to see. And I was like, yeah, they're just discovering us now, you know, in 2020. Um, and uh, so all that to say is that I feel, uh, you know, now because of various things, there's been a demand, there's a racial reckoning that's happening. There's a demand from uh, from us filmmakers in the industry that we need to tell our own stories that's finally being, you know, sort of listened to somewhat. Um, and so I'm definitely someone uh, who's reaping the benefits of that. Um, and, you know, we'll see how long it lasts. <laughs> we'll see how, uh, you know, how long, how long it lasts. But, you know, and now we have spaces like Black Star and, other places that are, you know, looking for our work and, and, and wanting to feature us and wanting to, and there's an audience for it and we know that. So I think that we're living in a very particular time period. Um, you know, I grew up I was listening to Mary's story felt similar to mine. I grew up in the theater. My mom was a playwright. She was a political playwright. Uh, she was someone that was quite ahead of her time in telling the stories that she was telling. Uh, you know, writing about police brutality, writing about black women's experience. Um, and, you know, she would, she would, uh, you know, she wasn't s someone who was wildly successful financially because of the stories that she was telling. Um, but she, her and other artists and black women artists really set up, you know, uh, what I'm reaping as a filmmaker today. And um, so, you know, I, I, I can't say I've had backlash. I mean, sometimes there's, you know, you always get weird reaction from some people about something. You know, my film, The New Black, which I think we're gonna show a clip from, really looks at homophobia within our own community. Um, so, you know, there's, there's that and telling truths and, and experiences and stories that are complex. You know, that's part of what I'm interested in. And, and we are complex as a people and we have different experiences and, you know, um, and this, the stories that, uh, you know, make up our experiences, I think are really fascinating. There's so many more. Um, so yeah, all that to say is that I, I haven't gotten a particular backlash, um, but I'm, you know, and I'm grateful to be able to keep telling these stories about so many aspects of our experiences that have been told or have been told incorrectly. Um, and that I'm living in a time when there is an interest in them and uh, you know, that I can work and do this work as a filmmaker. Well, who were some of the filmmakers that you looked up to or who modeled the way for you? Well, I have to say, um, you know, I go back to, again, similar to Maori growing up in the 80s and, and the 80s, 70s and 80s, you know, it's not like we had a lot of role models. Um, certainly, 
not in documentary. <laughs> you know, I had always loved documentary, but I didn't think it would be something, you know, you asked early about, you know, having a camera in your hand, like, you know, the technology wasn't even accessible and it was expensive. And I didn't see black women who were, you know, documentary filmmakers. Um, there were a few, but, you know, it's not something that like I knew or knew about or that they were getting the press or they were making work all the time to be out there. You know, I have to say one of my um, earliest, you know, I have two early memories of um, one watching uh, the film, the documentary about Madam C.J. Walker by Stanley Nelson uh, when I was a teen and Stanley, you know, has since became a, a mentor and a, and a colleague. Uh, but that was probably the first documentary, I think even before Eyes on the Prize that I remember seeing and being like, oh my gosh, this history is <laughs> amazing. And, you know, you can do this through watching you know, through a film. Um, you know, I also remember um, standing online uh, for She's Gotta Have It um, and it being online, you know, it was a theater by Lincoln Center um, where I grew up in New York and it just being like super exciting. Like it was a huge deal to be waiting online for, to watch this film by a black filmmaker. Uh, and then I also remember um, when uh, A Dry White Season by Uzan Palsi came out. And that was the first film uh, that was, I think, distributed by a major studio, a, a Black woman filmmaker. And that was a big deal. So these, you know, these moments where, that I distinctly remember of like, oh, this is a possibility. This is something that I could do even before you know, I really discovered documentary film, which wasn't until I was in my 20s and in the 90s. But, you know, that this was, these, these people were setting the path and setting, um, you know, showing the way for people like me who were, you know, growing up and seeing their films and seeing that it, that it can be done. And of course, that continues today with, again, so many of the women like Ava and Lena Waithe, who's in How It Feels to Be Free and you know, Shonda Rhimes and Issa Rae and all these amazing, you know, creators. Thank you for that. I remember being at Sundance one year and um, I think you were there with us, but it was Uzan Palsy was there and I was just was like, bow down, you know, she definitely, uh, and I was, I remember we were on the little trolley and it was um, Sister Uzan, it was Casey Lemons. Yes. yes. <laughs> it was like, Absolutely, uh, yeah. With Shari Freelo, it was just, yeah, yeah. it was just beautiful. Yeah. Um, conversation where we actually got to to witness and see each other. And those of us who are not filmmakers um, were just, you know, in awe of it. It was actually the year that Hustle and Flow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was at Sundance. Uh, I think maybe it might have been the last time I was at Sundance. And I got to, I have pictures with Kazi Lemons, Julie Dash, um, me. I mean, I was in, these are, these are women who set the path. I mean, they were the trailblazers you know, um, and so generous and so wonderful, you know, all uh, into, you know, talking about their experience and mentoring. And, and now these women, I mean, the other part about it, right, is that those trailblazers of the 80s and 90s then didn't work for a long time. That's right. Right. That's the crazy thing. <laughs> and that shows the racism and sexism of the industry. And then it was folks like Ava uh, and others who, you know, who, who gave them, who reignited their career mm -hmm. um, because it was, it's about pushing that ball forward. And I think that, you know, hopefully with How Feels to Be Free, we see some of that, that work and how there's, you make progress, there's progress made. And then oftentimes there's a backlash or, there's you, you there's a re, re, retrenchin, retrenchin, a re, you know, retrench or whatever that word is. And the question that we really have for today and the people that I interviewed is like, what's going to happen now? Like we're in this time of an amazing, like these amazing women, black women behind the camera. We're in the racial reckoning where Hollywood, you know, is again, reckoning with its structural racism and sexism. All industries are, like I just said the other night, you know, they just took Aunt Jemima off the shelf in 2020. You know, if you think about that, that's kind of cra 
crazy, but what is going to happen in the future? Like where, what will happen? And I think yep. it's to be, it's just, you know, we don't know. We don't know. Um, Elizabeth and Nia, if you could, let's, let's play all of the clips that we have uh, remaining uh, and get back into it. Appreciating what you're saying so much, Yoga. Because, yeah.
Yeah, let's take a breath. Um, so I wanted to um, put together those film clips um, just to illuminate even further the, the conversation on truth telling that is documentary filmmaking, of course, but a specific kind of storytelling that I believe black women um, that we do and the way in which we do it. And, you know, it may be Black History Month, you know, for some people, at least on the market, but it's, it's, it's Black history for us every day. And um, it's Black women's history every day as well. So Yorba, can you, can you talk about, you know, how you pick a story, you know? Uh, and sometimes you're invited to the story, but you still say yes or no to them. Um, you know, and we can talk a little bit a bit, a bit about this. And then, you know, I want to kind of close the, the video loop with the uh, segment from How It Feels to Be Free on with Alicia Keys and, you know, what she says. But how do you pick a story? And, you know, something that is still very much alive for us is the killing of Breonna Taylor. So, oh, good. yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, as you said, some stories come to me. Um, and I'm asked if I'm interested. Uh, that's how the sit-in, uh, uh, Harry Belafonte hosts the Tonight Show uh, came. Um, and uh, the Green Book, my film about the Green Book, I was also approached uh, by a production company. And with stories like that, um, I, you know, one of the things I'm, I'm interested, I'm always interested in stories that I don't know, that I think I do know. Um, so with the Green Book and with the sit-in, those were stories that I didn't know uh, that were so powerful uh, in terms of, you know, a part of our experience, part of history. I mean, with Harry Belafonte, I of course knew who he was and um, knew uh, his significance, but didn't know the extent of uh, what he did and his his friendship with Dr. King and hosting the Tonight Show for a week in 1968 when America was in upheaval, all the guests that he had on. So it really was one of those things where when uh, I was approached as a director to see if I would be interested in directing, I, I was immediately intrigued and wanted to do it. With the Green Book, same thing, a, a, a book that was created to help us navigate terrorism in this society that was produced from 1936 to 1967 um, and held so many, um, you know, really was a, a roadmap to uh, our uh, freedom uh, in terms of our progression in civil rights and to so many businesses and uh, middle, the building of the middle class. So it just was a way to tell through this small story, these larger stories and themes. With Brianna Taylor, um, I was approached by the um, production company in the New York Times um, who wanted to look into what happened. At that point in June of last year, there was very little known. Um, she had just started, you know, her case had just started to get attention. And of course, I immediately said yes. I mean, I was, you know, we were sitting here in the pandemic, we were watching the the police, the uprisings about police killings with George Floyd and Ahmaud Aubrey. Uh, Ahmaud wasn't a police killing, but uh, the killings on, you know, that went viral. Um, and I knew this was a story that I needed to, to tell. Um, and so it was, you know, a lot of it is instinctual. A lot of it is, does it move me? As I said, how it, feel to be, how it feels to be free. I read the book and I wanted to make the film. So part of being a documentary filmmaker, which I love is really being open and being open to where you get inspiration, what, uh, what you know, to open to stories and what you think you can, what you think you can bring to it. Um, and, and, and you're passionate about it because, you know, How It Feels With Free took five years to get made. Um, Brianna Taylor was, it was a real crash. We did that in like two months. And both of those things have their challenges. So you really have to have a passion. Um, and so I, I, I wanna work on stories that I'm you know, bringing my own passion, my own skills um, to bear. So it's, it's quite instinctual in a lot of ways. I wanna, I wanna read a question before we um, show the last clip from uh, one of the folks in the Zoom, uh, Yeva 
says, I have a question for both filmmakers about their thoughts on what mixes of artists and creatives to include in your projects. As we are here at the Museum of the African Diaspora, I came to this program through the open mic poetry program at MOAD. Do you work with poets and visual artists? What are your thoughts on the mix of creatives and social activists continuing to make connections, especially in the multiplicities of black communities and the African diaspora more globally? That's a lot of question. <laughs> well, I'll just uh, say that I think documentary is really expanding as a genre, which is amazing. And folks are doing very interesting things with poetry, uh, with poets, with visual artists, um, not only about those, but how to integrate those, uh, you know, those formats into film. And I, I think it's fantastic and ways that we can continue to engage a viewer that's artistically, you know, artistically moving and, and interesting, um, I think is great. And that's part of the reason why I love documentary, that it can be a lot of different things. Mayori, did you wanna add anything to that in terms of working across genre? Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely um, am working with artists who often are multi-hyphenate. So there are artists who are poets and filmmakers or who, you know, are activists and artists. And the thing that I was thinking reading that question is that, um, you know, I don't think mixing artists and, and activists mixing is not new, right? Like I think that is, art is always essential to any social movement. Um, that's how we remember them largely. Um, and so uh, if it is a documentary film, if it's a song, if it's narrative, I mean, I think there's also a lot, uh, before we had, um, I think the capacity to create documentary films, we often, the truth is in literature, right? Like it's a narrative work. Um, and um, yeah, so that, that's all that I was thinking. I mean, I, I think for the Black Star projects, but also anything that I work on, most of the folks are doing everything, <laughs> kind of doing all the things, so. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth and Nia, can you show us the clip, please? Definitely can relate to the, the multi-hyphenateness of, of our identities, because you have to do it. You want to do it all. So beautiful. Um, I wanted I wanted us to close out with that clip. Um, and Yorba, have you 
say you know anything about kind of the whole production of this. I know Alicia Keys had you know a, a, another role in addition to being you know someone who was one of the respondents to the film, but a, a producer yeah, as well. Is that correct? You know. Yeah, she was an executive producer of the film. She came on. Uh, we I got connected to her through her producer at the time, uh, Susan Lewis, and it was very funny because when we met, they had actually read the book uh, on their own and were interested in how to make it a film. So when I brought this idea to them, uh, you know, she immediately came on and lent her name to the project, which is great. Uh, and you know, I guess just to to close out that. I think I see this film as a historical piece, but also as a uh, film to, to help us, possibly guide us, give us guidance in how we move forward in terms of, um, you know, being in the industry and in terms of how we represent ourselves um, on, on, you know, in media in general. Um, and also taking charge of our own narrative. I, I mean, that's really what, this ultimately this film is about. Um, so that is really, you know, the work that I hope that I know will, uh, despite, you know, what the industry does and doesn't want to do, but will continue. Thank you. And just moving back to our, our statement beforehand, I know when I went to scroll through the American Master site, uh, I saw, and I think Mia put into the chat, there's a playlist of- yeah of Black women's empowerment and freedom to accompany the documentary. So yes, in the chat, or if you didn't yep. see, go and look on PDF. Yes. Dope. Dude, who? And that playlist was created by my wife, Corey Enyard, who I believe you know. So you know, Corey. Corey, come on. <laughs> I was like, that's yes, right. Exactly. Love it. Well, I'm really excited about that. Um, to my, my last uh, inquiry of the both of you, is around this, this uh, construct of artist as first responder, which we've been speaking to. That uh, art, of course, is essential, but that artists are essential workers and should be recognized, um, supported, and paid according, accordingly to that. And I wanna, I'd like to just get your thoughts on how the idea lands for you. Artists as first responder, artists haven't had a day off, you know, throughout this pandemic, in fact, we kicked it up, you know. In fact, there isn't, as Maori uh, stated, there isn't any movement on this planet that isn't fueled by the creative. The song, the chant, the movement, the poem, the book that inspires the film, whatever, the AR, the VR, all of it uh, is at a whole nother level. So Maori, can you, you know, when you hear artist as first responder, what comes, you know, what comes to you? Um, well, I think what I was saying uh, <laughs> probably comes to me, but I guess what I could add is just that um, I think in this particular uh, moment of crisis, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and the response to you know, the murders of this spring and summer, um, I, I think we've been relying on the work of artists to get us through, right? Um, I don't know that we necessarily needed the art to make us aware this time, but I know so many folks just needed time off, right? Like just to have like a break, um, you know, we're so aware uh, of uh, needing self-care and all of these things now. And so many people talk about what they do to take care of themselves. And it's, you know, I'm watching Bridgerton, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or it's like, whatever it is that they're doing, is uh, listening to music or, you know, um, watching Steve McQueen's small acts, whatever it is that people are doing to find, uh, to regenerate themselves is nine times out of 10 um, involving the work of an artist. And I think to your point, there hasn't been time off in that way. Um, so many people, I think, felt a lot of pressure to keep producing. Um, when we should, we could have, I think, leaned into being shut down a little bit. Um, and, and some of it is self-inflicted. I was listening to that quote just now with Alicia Keys, like the blocks that we put up are often self, um, we, we do them to ourselves, but also some of it, I felt like nonprofit arts organizations seemed to me 
to feel like they had to make themselves relevant in these ways that were very uncomfortable to me um, in April and May and June and like this rush to um, to produce. And then we were asking artists to produce and we were often asking them to produce for free. And I, it was really like this rush, I think, to, to prove that we could exist if the world was shut down. And I, I'm still concerned that we're not thinking about ways to be um, new. I think that that's what this moment offers us, a chance to like revise everything. And um, I hope that we can come out of this. Um, I'm even thinking about um, what I th think you were going, Yoruba, earlier around um, how many black and brown folks are being brought into the industry and having opportunities to make work, but how much of that is gonna be sustained uh, I'm very curious um, about that and hoping that it is like a lasting shift um, and that we continue um, to bring other people through, um, as you pointed out with other examples. Um, but I, that's not necessarily answering your question, but those are all the things that come up for me. Well, I think about the fact that how we don't support artists in this country, um, you know, right at the beginning of the pandemic, I remember reading about how the city of Berlin gave uh, uh, subsidies to artists and a recognition of the vibrance of the artist sector in the economics of the city. And we really need to do some, some, you know, some work needs to really be done about that. I mean, people are doing that work and trying to get the government to recognize that. Um, and that's, you know, the, the sector is not only, it's not only a first responder, that we have emotionally, what we listen to, what we watch, but it's also a huge employer of people and a huge training and mentorship of people um, that is not recognized as part of the economic sector. Uh, and it's obviously been fully, I mean, in the, you know, New York, the Bay Area, Philadelphia, where we all are, and, uh, and many other places. The, the impact, I don't think is gonna be seen for quite some time in terms of, how this pandemic, how the pandemic has hit, hit artists and hit um, the artistic economy, the economy of the arts, which is, you know, sewn into why people want to come to all these cities that we live in or why people, you know, go to what they go to school for, what they train for, what they do mentorship programs for. Um, you know, there's always, when we have a democratic president, there, we start to hearing a push again to make uh, you know, a, a, to make a cultural ambassador like a cabinet level position. Um, and, and I think we do need to do something like that and to really be taken seriously as the, the you know, the importance uh, economically, culturally of the artist, you know, in this country. Thank you. Thank you both for, for your time and for sharing um, your thoughts. And your passion. I'm glad we got to, to take a peek at just a little bit uh, of the work that you've been offering in service to community as truth tellers, as storytellers, as sisters, sister friends. Um, I want to invite folks to listen to another talk that's coming up. Elizabeth and Ania, I know we have some, a couple of announcements. One, of course, um, Blatant is, in addition to being this monthly online live conversation forum, it's also a zine. And so the second edition will be out in April, but there are a few copies left in the Moad bookstore. So if you'd like to actually have a physical, you know, accompaniment to these conversations, an actual broadsheet, um, there is a conversation that's gonna be happening, if you go to the next slide, um, with Yerba Richen this, Sunday, African Diaspora Film Club, our beloved comrade, brother our Cornelius Moore, will be hosting a conversation um, on how it feels to be free with you. And I guess it's five o'clock PST, Pacific time. And so for y'all who haven't joined the, the film club, you watch the film first. So we're not, they're not showing the film on Moad's platform. You have to watch the film first. Is that, that's correct, Yerba? And then there's a conversation that, that gets yes with you all. So um, if you haven't gone on to PBS and American Masters and watched the, the film, please do that and, and come to the MOAD site for a conversation. 
in addition to those kinds of conversations, we continue to insist upon black space. And so there'll be a black space residency conversation uh, with myself, Erica Demon, Ron Saunders, and Bento Ayofemi, and will be moderated by uh, the curatorial coordinator. Mm, I'm not sure I'm getting her title correctly, but Elena Gross will be uh, in conversation with us coming up on uh, Friday, next Friday from 12 to one. And the last slide of course is next month. So um, every third Tuesday of the month from four to 5.30, sometimes a little later like today, please join us for the next blatant conversation. Uh, my friends, Sam Vernon and Kentora Davis uh, and I will be talking about art, joy, rage, all these things as well. So um, with that deep thanks to Moad and to Elizabeth and Nia for running tech. Thank you to Mayori and your team sharing your time with us today and Yoruba, your team and your family sharing your work and your time with us today. And just wanna have you all in uh, check out Moad to donate to Moet, to become a member of the Museum of the African Diaspora, to support the museums and the galleries and the independent uh, arts workers wherever you live. But specifically today, you can check out Moad and text a gift to them at 56512 and just type in Moad, M-O-A-D-S-F. You can follow the link. You can hold your phone up to the screen right now. It'll take you to the donate page. Um, I'm really glad that you all are joining us every month and, and keeping up with it. And my platform, Artists as First Responder, and all of the partners that we have, including the Girls and Women of Color Collaborative, African American Art and Culture Complex in San Francisco, Akinati Foundation in Oakland, California, the San Francisco Foundation, the Wakanda Dream Lab, the Women's Foundation of California, and the Walter and Elise Haas Fund. Um, thank you all. Thanks for thank being here. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening, Black women. I love you. Love you. Love you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Conversation today.